Trisha, they call me Mama Pat. So, and I just want to thank everybody for being here. Um, this is my baby, right here. It's my baby. And from a mother's point of view, no matter how old your child gets, you still see them like this. When you think of them in your mind, they're, they're like this. This is how you think of them. Um, and to have a child in prison, we serve this time with them as mothers, as parents. We walk every day with them. We feel their pain just like we're there. Um, I want to thank these two mothers for coming out. They're going to tell you their story of what happened with their, with their child um, in the prison system in solitary confinement. Um, it takes a lot of courage to stand up here and talk about it. It's painful. And I want to thank you, too, uh, for coming out and, and being okay with telling their good story. Um, it takes a lot of strength. When I first started talking about my son, I was afraid. I was even afraid to call the prison, and I needed people to hold, hold my hand and call the prison with me and find out what was going on with my son. So it takes a lot of strength. Some people have it, some people don't. But we try to you know, work with everybody who's having trouble with their loved ones in prison. So I have Erica Murray, um, Erica Murray here, and Tanisha Scotts here. So we want to start with Erica. We just want you to tell, um, just tell your story, and then I'll ask you questions later on, and the audience may want to hear some questions from you. But just tell your story, what happened. I'm a little nervous. I have been in prison for five years. And um, in 2017, and we were corresponding like all the time. In 2017, we lost contact. I was right in the prison, um, and I was getting no response back. From 2017 until 2018, well, 2019, 18, 18, um, he was in solitary confinement. Um, he said that they were doing things to his food. Um, he had got transferred one time and came with Rita for, uh, for like a psychological evaluation. My son is a small guy, like my other son here behind, but my son might have been about 90 pounds when I went to go see him. Um, he said that he wasn't eating because he was fearful that they were putting something inside his food, but also he wasn't in his right state of mind. He had shaved all of the hair on his face, and um, he said he just woke up one day like that. And um, my son was with me, and just, you know, just basically, like, out of his mind, what we didn't know, um, like, what day it was, kind of what year it was, and, like, what happened to him, but what he could remember in the little when he was in his right state of mind, if I could say that, is that it was like the guards. And, you know, like how he was being treated because he, um, like, had some words or something with the guards. He just remembers, like, waking up and not really remembering anything. So at this time right now, my son is, like, um, on medication. He never had a mental problem in his life. He is 29 years old. Now he hears voices, um, and you know, like when I'm talking to him, like when I can, because you know you really can't talk to them. So every now and then, when I get a chance to talk to him, he's like, Mom, you know, like don't talk about God, don't talk about this, like it like sets him off. And that's because he's like in the cell all of the time. And then also they say it's like a 23 and 1, that's not true. They let them out when they want to let them out. Right. So they don't take showers every day. You know, they don't get an hour out. Um, if they want to let them out, then they'll let them out. And he said it's, it's like three times a week, but he doesn't come out three times a week. That's not true. So it's just like a lot of, you know, you'll call. I called Miss Pat because I was pushed back in the corner. I basically didn't know what to do. And you can call central office. You can call the counselor. You can call and talk to the assistant, 
to the war end and the, 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 who runs the prison and you still get nowhere. They just like run you around in a circle. It's like it's a, they put one, they'll say talk to this person and talk to another person and talk to them, and nothing ever gets done. So now I have a child that was and still is highly intelligent who is suffering from a mental condition and um, all at the hands of the prison system. And I'm not saying that he shouldn't have went there and, you know, did his time, he was found guilty and that's fine, but to brutalize him mentally, you know, for, for what purpose is that? And I believe my son. <coughs> so, um, how did you find out that your son had had this mental breakdown? How, um, how, how did you find out? We had no contact. It? Yeah, but you found out about it at one point? Well, I called, and um, it was the, uh, it directed me to the, the mental health, the mental health department, but in another prison, because they had transferred him too, and I didn't even know that he got transferred from like one prison to another. So he was in SCI Somerset, and then he was like SCI Green. Mm -hmm. Then he went to Gradyford. Then he went to Gradyford. And a friend of yours saw him and told you to come down. Exactly, because he looked horrible. Right. And then he was talking to himself, and he had on the blue, um, they call it blueberries. You know, they wear the different color um, jumpers when you're in prison. But he was like um, over there in solitary confinement for a mental evaluation and said that he had on blue like blueberries or whatever they call them. But yeah, I went to Raiderford and it was horrible. And I had my younger son John with me as well. And um, he was out of his mind. I remember you told me that you barely even recognized him. That he, was, he was probably less than 90 pounds. And they're probably the same height and same weight. My son is, other son is small as well. And um, just, he was so, he was dark too. It was like dark, um, you could see, like visibly, like see his bones. And um, it's just so much mispack. Like I could just go on, you know, and just continue to talk. Try to say that, your, you know, your child is like making these things up. He went to court because he had the situation with the guard within Somerset, he's in Green now, and um, they sent him to court and he has no lawyer, not even a public defender. And I mean, I'm not in a position to like hire a lawyer out there to take, like I've done, I'm financially strapped. So they already had my son going to court with no lawyer because they said that he um, didn't want the public defender. But if he's not in his right state of mind and they know that he's on medication, yeah suffering basically like he's a schizophrenic now and never anything wrong, why would you let him go to court with no lawyer to represent himself? And that's the uh, uh, example of the um, the abuse that the prisoner goes through and then what the parent has to go through too, just trying to get information about their child. Like, you know, is he okay? And they give you the runaround and you can't speak to him. <coughs> They can't tell you anything. And then they're prosecuting him and giving him more time in solitary confinement, and he's not even in his right mind. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, he did his time, he came home, or he did his time, he came home. Um, my son pleaded guilty to the aggravated assault, assault charge. But um, Quadri. Is not, I'm not going to say a perfect kid. He ain't, you know, he does his little stuff out in the streets or whatever. But my son was always able to maintain a top sentence and do it without having any kind of problems inside the prison. Um, he was a good chess player. He does, he does know how to get along with others. And he know how to stand up for himself inside of prison because, like the guy was saying, you know, you get infractions in jail. You know, and um, there's all types of stuff going on inside of jail, drugs, whatever else, prostitution, all types of stuff, we all know that. But um, I don't know, my son had an altercation. He got sentenced in 2017, he got sent up Rockview Prison. <coughs> so he was up Rockview Prison for, I guess, uh, 2017 up until present. Now he's in Camp Hill, we'll get to that. Um, you know, my son, like she just explained, you know, he was calling, you know, his aunt 
you know, uh, me and him didn't have like a, a perfect relationship, but he'll call, say hi, how you doing mom, you know, just checking in with you and my sisters and my brothers and everything like that. He constantly call to let me know that he's okay. Uh, like she said, we do, in my fact, just that we have connections with our child, so we know <coughs> something go wrong. So I started calling the prison because my son had got a fraction. Um, because first, let me step back. He stopped calling, stopped receiving calls. So I felt like something was wrong because I haven't heard from him in um, 90 days. You know, so. But before the 90 days, I kept calling up to the prison and asking him, like, what's going on with my son? Why he hasn't been calling? He said, because he got sent to the hole. And I asked him, I said, well, why is he sent to the hole? Um, they wouldn't tell me what the reason was, you know, so I tried to drag it out of the counselor. This was his first counselor because they keep giving him certain, certain amount of counselors, however. And so, uh, so I called back, like, the next, you know, the next month or whatever to call and check on my son. And he said that my son was okay or whatever, and my son was doing well. So I got worried. I sent somebody from the society up there um, to go visit my son. She gave me a report stating that my son was re refusing to talk to her. And I didn't understand why would my son refuse to talk to you when my son is highly intelligent, and he never not talked to nobody. So that was an indicator right there something's going on. So I constantly kept calling and calling and calling and calling, and he kept giving me a runaround, too. So, you know, I, I constantly kept calling and calling and calling. So, they just told me, like, um, they just told me, you know, he'd be out the hole, and so I waited for him. And this was in 2017. This is practically when he first started. When he was in there, August the 30th, it was the 6th, 2017. August the 3rd, 2017. Um, September, August, September, October, November, December. My son was in a hole during his birthday. You know, he was in a hole. January, February, March. So it lingered all the way out. He was all, you know. So I started calling the superintendent, going in, you know, superintendent X and stuff. So they started giving me the run around and everything like that. So before this year, it was a call that came in and they told me that my son was in a hole and they were starving my son. And he wasn't beating my son, he was mistreating my child. So all hell broke loose then. Since I knew now what was going on with my child, now I got a right to start going at the prison. So, you know, after that, you know, I constantly like, um, well, after that, you know, as any mother do, you know, I couldn't call the prison at nighttime. So what I did was I waited for the very next day, anticipating when the sun was going to come up, so I could start making my calls. And I looked, and I let them know that I knew what was going on with my son. I knew. Now I know what y'all doing with my son, so now I'm coming at you. So now I got a right to start coming at you, start charging you with full force, because I didn't know what was going on first. So now I got to fight for my child. So, you know, I started letting them know, like, listen, I'm coming down there, I'm going to visit, I'm coming to visit my son. And so what I did was, it was December the 20th, I went down there to visit my son, December the 21st, I got a, I went down there, I got a ride to visit my son. Right, like very next day, day after I heard, I told them that I'm coming down there. I told them, I said, I heard y'all start with my son. I heard that, that he was getting beat on. I said, I'm coming down there and I'll be down there. That, that was just it. I went down there and I visited my son. He was behind him, behind the mirror and he did not look himself. My son was uh, out of his mind. My son was, uh, it seemed like he was blanked out. He didn't, he, he didn't get excited by seeing it. Like he would normally be, you know. He was, he was in a, he was like up in his head somewhere lost, you know what I mean. So I knew something was wrong, but at the same token, I had to remain humble. So you know, and I told the person, the, the guard, and everything because he had no visits, and I need to stay on my behalf. I didn't go see my son, which I really, really regret. You know what I'm saying? But um, I'm here now, and and I am fighting for him right now. And it's been a war with this prison, so I'm gonna let you know what happened. So I went down there, and I see my son. The visit went crazy. He started standing on the stools, went all out of, you know, everything just went haywire. You know, he wouldn't be able to sit down for two minutes to talk to me and that thing. But he did say, look at my skin color. So he hadn't been getting called niggers up there. He hadn't been being disrespected up there for his race. He hadn't been called all types of names. You know, and then he gave me a signal because when you got a bond with your child, they'll let you know what's going on. 
So when I, when he immediately, he, ended, he had to do something to distract the guards, but he also let me know, like, Mom, you know, this is what's going on. I have him up, I have him up, and I have him up. Okay, that's what you had to do, and they got you, they standing right there trying to escort you out? Say no more. So, you know, I read between lines with my son, because he must, he, he went crazy, but he ain't that crazy. And he knew what type of person I am, he knew what kind of mom he got. So once he got that out, I was able to read between lines, which made me go full force. So, you know, I had to go full force on You know, I, I kind of let the, uh, I, I kind of let them know, like, you know, because cause they got, they kind of got worried. They kind of like, oh, dad, she ain't getting excited, she ain't hyped. No, what kind of mom is this? Like, she not jumping all over the place because she seen her son? No, I'm not going to get like that. But I am going to let you know that I'll be back with an attorney. Mm -hmm. I'll let you know this. He got a mother who's, who's going to be right there by his side. And he came in here with no mental problems. And y'all had my son in the hole for this amount of time. I said, so right now it's up to you and your discretion to get him out of the hole. Because this ain't over. So I walked out, I let him, because I need to let you know, when I first went in there, my son denied his visit. He denied it automatically, would not come out. <coughs> so, you know, when he didn't come out the hole, that was like a red light indicator also. But something told me to go back in there and request to see your son. So this is how I knew my son was sick because they said I'm gonna get the psych I'm gonna get the psych psychiatric go get him. So what is my son doing in the mental ward? You know, and then full force. So I've been at it with the prison. You know, my son been transferred out of the prison because I went straight at the director's neck. Director of mental health, a social, a mental health a central office got my son out of there. He's over there in Camp Hill getting evaluated right now. So, one minute. Just want to point out that um, we're kind of running out on time, but I want mm -hmm. everybody to understand your pain mm -hmm. and what you guys are going through. And both of y'all went through the same thing. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to point out is that the way that these mothers found out about what was going on with their child was from somebody on the inside, called mm -hmm. them and let them know. Mm -hmm. Someone called Erica and told her, look, you better get down here. Yeah. Your son is down here and he is not himself. She jumped in her car and went to grave her mm -hmm. and saw her son. Same thing happened to uh, Miss Taisha. Mm -hmm. Somebody called and said, they are abusing him. I've seen it. This is happening. You need to check in on your son. So the prisoners did help. I don't think the, the person <coughs> even knew who no. their son was. Because the story started out by somebody just going over and then explaining the story to somebody who they didn't know was my brother. Right, and that's how I got back to you. And my brother got through my mom and called me. Right. So he never even knew that this was my my They were my, just my telling the story about, about the story how bad they were treating this, this young boy. And how old is your son? 20, 23. 23. Mm -hmm. How bad they were treating this young boy. Mm -hmm. He go to put his hands out to get mm -hmm. his food. And he take his hand in the, in the hatch. He his hand in the, in the hatch. Mm -hmm. Miss um, um, Erica's a friend told her about what was happening with her son. And mm -hmm. she went down here. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you guys had the call, this would have still been going on. Mm -hmm. That's what we're saying. If you had the call, then we had the call at the prison. If you mm -hmm. had the call, Miss mm -hmm. Taisha been calling every day. She calls the prison every single day. We were at the prison visiting, and they said, we heard them talking. They said, I hope this lady don't call here again. That's how many times she was calling. So it, it does help, but we need to do more. And we're telling you these stories because we need to do more. They put our loved ones in those solitary confinement cells, and it's over. It's like a, a black hole. I mean, they could be waterboarding them, as far as I know. Nobody knows. Nobody's going to tell you. They in mental stress, they can't even tell you what's happening to them. And, so this and not to mention that since since they I had got the information from John Mewitt saying that you're one of the the most powerful mothers he ever met in 18 years. Mm -hmm. Going full force at a prison like right. that. Right. So they, they are voluntarily giving us information. Miss Mama Pat, right. Miss Yvonne, they are helping us out now to see more you know, to get this thing rolling. Right. Investigate, right. Investigation happened in two weeks. They had an investigator down there talking to the, to the witness in two weeks' mm -hmm. time. So, I mean, you know, they know that this is no joke with me. Yeah, but we need this to happen for all the, all the, uh, all the guys out there. We need this to happen for all of them. We need and, that, and that's why we have this bill in place, HB 2214,
that will limit solitary yeah. confinement to not more than 15 days. Because yeah. the psychiatrists say if you're in here more than 15 days, it has an impact on you mentally, mm -hmm. especially if you're young, yes. Yes. if you already got mental problems, you know, you're pregnant, it already has a, a, a horrible impact on you. Um, so we're trying to get this bill 2214 passed. Uh, and we're hoping that, you know, you guys, in the end of after all this is over, that we, you know, get some support with getting this bill, because these kind of things has got to stop. Yeah, we do. Um, do we have time for questions from the audience um, or not? Yeah, we got like five minutes, so we okay. can, I know people definitely want to speak. James? Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I got a cold, so my voice is really... Um, I spent 33 years in the mm -hmm. 33. I death row. Okay, so I've been in solitary confinement, not only on death row, but also in disciplinary, where your sons is at, you know, DC or AC. Okay, so I'm very familiar with going on. You feel me? My thing is, there should be more parents, more people of the prisoners should be in here. See, most of these people are outside people. They don't have sons or daughters in those holes. But I love y'all because y'all here to, to support. So you're here to support, okay? Now, right now, I must tell y'all, I'm very passionate about what I'm talking about, but at this point, and my man here, I know he's gonna tell me about it later, he can do it right now. Right, um, I got a personal thing going on, so I'm kind of emotional, okay? But it has nothing to do with what I'm going to say. But for real, for real, I've been around all these organizations since I've been home. I've been home six months, 35 years. Please remember that. Yeah. I know what I'm talking about, and I'm telling you psychologically, okay, because you're dealing with a hell of an enemy, for real, okay, so, and they're vicious, they're so vicious, really, so, you know, okay, I know we ain't got that time, so I gotta go, but I really do have things to say, so my last thing to say here, is that we need to network, you know, all these issues. See, all these issues really are connected. Mm -hmm. So we have this issue here, we have this issue here, we got this issue here. But for real, for real, everybody that's supporting each issue should be supporting each issue together. It should be a connected thing, yeah. an umbrella thing. So that's all I'm gonna say right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I just really wanna say like, it's so important that y'all know this now. You know, he did 35, I did 36. There's a new enemy in that prison, at that prison system. And it's in drugs. Oh. It's knocking them down. But the important thing the that we need to know is stay in touch. Because when you ain't in touch with your loved ones, that's when they hurt you. When that mail don't come, when them phone calls don't come, you know, I did 14 and a half, 14 and a half years of Huntington in the early 80s. And he was killing us every month. So if you ain't got if you ain't got the time, I don't care who you is, I don't care if you got your your, your son one, let that mail go through. Accept them phone calls. Because that's the key. Because when you don't, that's like you say, it's a deeper enemy. And when they see that you a butthole and ain't no mail coming, you're their target. Excuse me. So Excuse me. Target. But you said it, but you know what? They taking that from us. Because at one point we had privacy letters. You had the privacy and the yeah. we, don't, we don't have that anymore. They don't have it, but but we're, so we're, we're attacking that too. No. We're doing that too. You know right that. now, we're going to concentrate on how to fix this problem, how to stop these prisoners from throwing our loved ones in solitary confinement and torturing them and <coughs> fixing them while they're down there. Because my, one of my things is, you know, I'm most likely, I am a strong advocate. So I don't have a problem with being aggressive or assertive. With what, I, with what I want out of the system. Persistent. I'm very persistent. Yeah. So that's yeah. why that's yeah. why they're doing persistent. what they're doing now. Because they know that I'm coming full force. 
and I'm not playing because I found out what's going on with my child. And they know that I will ride eight hours away and I will knock on their door because they think that I will not leave and I will not turn myself away. So they feel as though like they don't want any problems. So they're going to try to do whatever they can to mend everything. But see, Mama Pat already know. I already told them they can't be fixed. There's nothing that you can do. And my son has already went out of his mind. So my thing is I have to put a voice out there and put the correctional officers on blast to let them know that they're mistreating people outside, inside the prison. I don't know. It's a lot of people that, like he said, mothers need to be in here. I can understand people who like the support, but if you really haven't felt what I'm going through or what she's going through, I don't know how much compassion you have to go in full force. See, I have hurt in me, and I have a lot of hurt in me, and I can't fight. So it's not physical. This is mental. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm trying to put together, I, I told her already, I don't care if I gotta call Channel 10, Fox 29 News, I don't care if I get a journalist, I don't care. You know what I'm saying? I don't care if I gotta be outside of the courthouse or whatever. I don't care if I gotta walk and be in 1301 Silver Street outside with a sign. I don't care because these correctional officers have to be held accountable. They have to be held accountable for their actions and they have to be called out by their name. You know what I'm saying? This is going to be I, I was I was hearing it go go that those those sisters speak. They was talking about their sons. And I couldn't help but reflect on my own experience. Uh, I felt that I was incarcerated at the age of sixteen. And I don't get out until I'm old man. Uh, I wasn't a juvenile lifer, mm -hmm. but I did more time than most juvenile lifers. Mm -hmm. And my experience was uh, Incarcerated, being confined in, in solitary confinement. When I first went to jail, there was only six prisons, mm -hmm. and and now they got so many prisons that I lost count. I don't know how many it is, but I was in fourteen. I ended up going to fourteen different jails, and out of the fourteen jails I've been in, I've been in solitary confinement in each and every one. Of them. Uh, the, the system is designed to to break men's mind. Mm -hmm. That's the whole purpose. It destroy your mind. It destroy your mind. A human mind. Uh, I was hearing you talk about your son about how you how you how you been solving. It's good to me. Uh, I was never under medication, and got, uh, when I first went in there, when I first went in South Jacob Family, what they used to do, they used to take your mattress out to sell. And they would come to, they would come and get your mattress six o'clock in the morning. And you don't get your mattress back until nine o'clock. Uh, me and a few other brothers, we got tired of that. Because like, we young. And so we rebelled against that system. We wouldn't give our mattress up. So we would fight every day, getting hit with new times and, and getting sprayed with mace. But we still took the stand of not giving our masters up. So what they did, they ended up changing that system and allowing people to keep their masters. They had a silent system where you couldn't talk out the door. Mm -hmm. And in solitary confinement, if you next door to me, you couldn't speak to me. Mm -hmm. Imagine how repressive that is. You wouldn't sell. And if you, you, you're not allowed to talk outside the door to no one, uh, we broke that. Uh, I've always been uh, a rebellious person. Always. Uh, and, 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 uh, <laughs> I've always been a rebellious person. And, uh, but we was able to break some of the rules. I was up Huntington, a ride transpired. And they put us in a hole and they would beat us every day. And we couldn't get mail. Our family members didn't know what was going on. But someone in population made contact with people in, in here in Philly and to our loved ones. And my aunt contacted a, 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 a person from the state representative office. And they came up. And around about nine, nine of them came up and they was caught the institution by surprise and they were and they, and they actually see each one of us and that too walk off the change. I'm saying parents and prisoners have to 
Right. Can and that's, that's, that's what we're about tonight. That's what we're about yeah. tonight. <coughs> we gotta, we so, gotta. So with that, I mean, the point that Tiller is making is when you fight, you win. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. When you fight, you win. Um, and just, you know, for context, until when I was a young boy, I met Attila in the SMU, special manager. Right. And I was one of the youngest in it, and he was one of the oldest, so he definitely has always been rebellious. Since um, so we 14. He's always been straight, straight up. And he was one of the brothers uh, that young guys coming through to go to Attila, and he would be someone that would keep you out of the jailhouse politics, the jailhouse nonsense, he would you know, give you cultural education. Um, he would just help kids, because that's what we were, maturing to, to men, to, to, to mature into our full potential within those camps. So thank you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So many different mentalities. Different mentalities. It's, it's hard, hard to get through it. So many different mentalities. It seems hard. It seems, it seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything, everything else, else is a challenge. Else is a challenge. Um, so, so I'm ready. For I'm ready challenge. for this challenge, and I was built, and I was for, built this. for this. I think that, I think that we, all we all have a purpose in life, in life. and mine is going to take on a task that most that most of back away back from. Away from. That impossible, that impossible. So people, people say it's impossible. I see possibilities. I don't see anything, I don't see anything as being impossible. Mentality. Mentality. There are there are different mentalities, but just like just there's like different there's different ways to teach people how to read. There's, there's different ways to communicate people. There's different ways different ways to communicate people and their different mentalities.